Hi, I'm Reverend Emily Webb, and I'm the minister at St. Andrew's Presbyterian Church in Sarnia, Ontario. St. Andrew's, the building, is a beautiful and historic church. We're actually going to be celebrating our 180th anniversary later this year, and we're located right downtown Sarnia, overlooking the St. Clair River. St. Andrew's, the people, are a very active and dedicated congregation in worship and faith formation, and in working with and supporting local missions and charities. The pandemic has changed how we do all of those things, but it certainly hasn't stopped us. And I am so grateful to have been called to such a wonderful church and to such a friendly community. I was inducted here at the end of September in 2019 after graduating from Knox College in May of 2019. I have many good memories of Knox, so I'm really pleased to be able to share with you in your worship this week. Hear today's call to worship. We are not the first to make the journey to Jerusalem. Many have gone before us and many will come after us. From near and far, God's people gathered to celebrate his goodness on the holy mountain. We are pilgrims on a journey. We are travelers on the road. Jesus often went to Jerusalem as a child to celebrate Passover. Now he sets his face towards Jerusalem again, knowing this time will be different. We are pilgrims on a journey. We are travelers on the road. Jesus' last journey to Jerusalem is somber. He has no illusions about what is to come. Still, he goes ahead doing God's will. We are pilgrims on a journey. We are travelers on the road. Let us pray. God of light, we want to follow Jesus' footsteps, but we have our fears and doubts. We would rather avoid the pain and darkness of our journey. Give us courage and perseverance when the journey is difficult and grace to help others along the road. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Fairest Lord Jesus, ruler of all O Thou of God to earth come down, Thee will I cherish, Thee will I honor, Thou my soul's glory, joy, and crown. Fair are the meadows, fairer still the woodlands, robed in the blooming garb of spring. Jesus is Jesus is purer, who makes the troubled heart to sing. Fair is the sunshine, fairer still the moonlight, and fair the twinkling starry host. Jesus. 
Jesus shines brighter. Jesus shines purer than all the angels have. Jesus is found in thee. None can be nearer, fairer or dearer than thou, my Savior, art to A reading from Psalm 51. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. According to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you alone, have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you are justified in your sentence and blameless when you pass judgment. Indeed, I was born guilty, a sinner when my mother conceived me. You desire truth in the inward being. Therefore, teach me wisdom in my secret heart. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins, and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and put a new and right spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence, and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and sustain in me a willing spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways, and sinners will return to you. Deliver me from bloodshed, O God, O God of my salvation, and my tongue will sing aloud of your deliverance. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth will declare your praise. This is the word of the Lord. A reading from Luke 5, 1-10. Now it came about that while the multitude were pressing around him and listening to the word of God, he was standing by the Sea of Galilee. And he saw two boats lying at the edge of the lake, but the fishermen had gotten out of them and were washing their nets. And he got into one of the boats, which was Simon's, and asked him to put out a little way from the land. And he sat down and he began teaching the multitudes from the boat. And when he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Put out into the deep water, and let down your nets for a catch. And Simon answered and said, Master, we worked all night and caught nothing, but at your bidding I will let down the nets. And when they had done this, they enclosed a great quantity of fish, and their nets began to break. And they signaled to their partners in the other boat for them to come and help them. And they came, and they filled both of the boats so that they began to sink. But when Simon Peter saw that, he fell down at Jesus' feet, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. 
for amazement had seized him and all his companions because of the catch of fish which they had taken. And so also James and John, sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, Do not fear. From now on you will be catching men. This is the word of the Lord. It must have been quite an ordinary morning on the lake. Gulls crying, waves murmuring, boats knocking gently against one another in their moorings. Peaceful, and far away from anywhere important out in the rural countryside. Three fishermen, after a long and unsuccessful night's work, washing their nets and getting ready to go home. The morning calm is disrupted by the sounds of a crowd headed their way, hot on the heels of an ordinary-looking man. When the man sees them, he asks if they'll put out one of their boats just offshore, let him use it as a, a kind of floating platform to teach from. Simon Peter agrees, and he sat in the boat, listening, as Jesus spoke to the crowd. When he's done, though, rather than putting back into shore, Jesus came up with a strange idea. Let's go fishing out into the deep water. I've got a hunch there's a catch out there. Simon, experienced fisherman that he was, tried to be polite to this landlubber. You know, master, we've been out the whole night and caught nothing. He didn't add, but was probably thinking. He doesn't realize that no one goes deep sea fishing in broad daylight around here. But Simon, having failed to accomplish much by his own tried and true methods, was in no position to question this strange suggestion. What he does say is the sentence that will change the entire course of his life. If you say so, we'll do it. You know how the story goes from here. Simon Peter let down his nets, and as he drew them up, the nets, empty all night, so full of fish now, begin to fray and break. He yelled for his partners to come with the other boat to help haul in the catch, and they filled both boats so full that they began to sink. Nets breaking, boats full to overflowing, Jesus sitting in the stern, no ordinary man at all. And Simon Peter falls down at Jesus' knees, gracelessly sliding around in the midst of all those fish, and says, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. Simon Peter is afraid. He's not afraid because his boat's sinking, and he's not afraid because his nets are breaking. Simon Peter is afraid because he has just figured out that God is somehow working through this man Jesus. Only God, after all, has anything like that kind of power over creation. Simon's afraid because he is, in some way, on this very ordinary morning turned extraordinary, in the presence of God. And he knows himself to be unworthy, inadequate, and so he helplessly tells Jesus to go, because he is too sinful to deserve to be in Christ's presence. But Jesus says, don't be afraid. From now on, you're going to be catching people. Simon's not wrong to be thinking he's inadequate, unworthy, and sinful. Simon Peter does not seem like the sort of person Jesus ought to be calling to fish for a more complicated, challenging catch. Anybody can have a bad day fishing, but if you wanted to find somebody to become a fisher of people, you might want, at the very least, somebody who had proven to be a reasonably effective fisher of fish. There was nothing particularly striking about any of the people Jesus called to follow him, like the middle-of-nowhere small fishing village in which Jesus chose to begin his ministry. Those first followers of his were just people. And Simon Peter was not kidding when he claimed to be a sinful man. This is the same Peter, after all, who started a who's the greatest disciple conversation, the same Peter who fell asleep in the Garden of Gethsemane, who cuts off someone's ear with a sword, who 
who denies Jesus three times and who, devastated at his own weakness and lost after Christ's death, gives up, abandons his call to follow Jesus, and goes back to fishing for fish. Simon Peter was not a perfect man, but maybe he didn't need to be. As it began for Simon Peter on that ordinary morning on the lake, after a disappointing night at work, so it often begins for us. When Jesus comes into the middle of our lives, where we work, where we live, by the lakeside, in the classroom, the hospital, the office, the factory, the kitchen, and he asks us to trust him enough to do some strange little thing like fishing in deep water in broad daylight. It's the the kind of thing that's a little different, a bit outside your usual routine and what you normally feel comfortable doing. But that's often where Jesus comes to us, where we least expect him, where we've failed, where we feel in over our heads, where we feel helpless, where we see our own futility and sense our own inadequacy. I wonder how often do we let ourselves off the hook and hide behind our inadequacies and unworthiness, how often we put off or avoid what God's asking us to do with our lives in a particular situation, at a pivotal moment, because we're more comfortable making excuses for not doing it. We say, we're not good enough at being Christian to share Jesus's love. We're not smart enough or good enough with words to tell people what that love means for us. We're not young enough to do anything useful or learn something new, not old enough to have the familiarity and experience to contribute, not rich enough to have the spare time to help out, not poor or struggling enough to have a good story to tell about God's grace. We get afraid wherever we are in our lives or on our spiritual journeys, that whoever we are in the world or in the church, that we are not enough for Jesus. When Simon Peter fell down at Jesus's feet in among the fish and said, depart from me, for I am a sinful man, when he recognized Jesus as somehow bringing him into God's presence, when he recognized himself as sinful, as unworthy, as not good enough to be there, Jesus did not disagree with him. Jesus didn't tell Simon Peter that he's wrong about being sinful and unworthy. But Jesus did tell him not to be afraid. And he gives him a mission to fish for people, to share Jesus's love and the good news of what that love means. Yes, Simon Peter is sinful. He is unworthy. He is as imperfect a human being as the rest of us. But that doesn't mean he needs to be afraid. And it doesn't mean that he can't help Jesus change the world. If we rounded up Jesus's first disciples and brought them all together and lined them up, I bet we'd never in our wildest imaginations guess just by looking at them that this ordinary group of people could change the world. But because of Jesus and their faithful commitment to him, they did. They planted churches and wrote bits of our Bible. They got it wrong sometimes and other times incredibly right. They worked hard and traveled far and took risks. Those ordinary imperfect people were enough for Jesus. And we are too. We are enough. And there is no place too unimportant, no moment too ordinary, where the love and presence of Jesus would be wasted. Our ordinary lives put us right where Jesus needs us to be, in the office, at the store, in the kitchen, the classroom, the hospital. Ordinary, everyday places and moments where Jesus's extraordinary grace His love and forgiveness are most needed. And even in extraordinary times, like the middle of a pandemic, this is still where Jesus calls us and needs us to be, speaking and living our faith, even as helplessness, anxiety, and uncertainty make us feel as frayed as an old fishing net and as overwhelmed as an overfull boat. There is a beautiful image of the gospel and what it means to follow Jesus tucked away in this story. 
And it is very like Luke to take broken, failing things and show us how Christ reverses the image, transforming what was broken into a sign of abundant life. Broken nets and sinking boats, these are things that would in any other situation be unfit for use. Instead, they are the means by which Jesus chose to reveal himself to his soon-to-be disciples. In the years that followed, I wonder if Peter ever looked back on that moment, abundant fish squelching under his knees, Jesus smiling down at him, and recognized himself in that broken fishing net, not perfect, not always knowing what to do, not getting it right, not every time, but more than enough for Jesus. Like Simon Peter, we don't need to be afraid that we are not enough for Jesus, that we're not enough for him to love, that we're not enough to accomplish the kingdom work he gifts us with, that we're not enough to live into the new abundant life he offers us. We are enough for Jesus, and Jesus is abundantly more than enough, full to bursting for us. Amen.
Please join me in prayer. Loving and gracious God, we thank you for calling us into relationship with you and for setting us in the world you love. We know, though, that the world, the way it is now, is not the way you created it to be. You made it good. And so we come to you together to speak of what we have seen, to lament the suffering we have witnessed, to release to you our own anxiety and lift up to you those whom we love. We are confident that you are listening, Lord, and that you will act for the good of all people and all creation. Sovereign God, we pray for those who lead, nations, cities, towns, businesses, and organizations of all sizes. In these times of never-ending challenge, give each leader the wisdom to make faithful decisions and courage when those decisions are unpopular. Help those who have power to use it justly and generously, and for the benefit of those who have no power at all. Reshape their hearts and minds in the image of your Son, so that those who need mercy and compassion may begin to receive it. O God, your Spirit has worked in the world throughout all generations. We thank you that we belong to you in this generation. We pray for lifelong believers and for those whose faith is new. May your church benefit from the wisdom of the experienced and the vibrancy of those beginning their journey. Help us work together in hope in this time of anxiety and uncertainty, so that our witness to your purposes and promises will invite others to discover life in you. Although we are all different, help us to speak with one voice, sharing your justice, your mercy, and your love, and being good neighbors to those in need. Compassionate and loving God, we pray for those who suffer in body, mind, and heart, for those who are ill or recovering from illness, for those who are struggling to cope with the uncertainty of aging, of financial burdens, or of spiritual challenges, and for those who are grieving. We pray especially for people who are in quarantine or in hospital because of COVID-19. We pray for health care and essential workers, for the friends and loved ones of those who are at risk. As the pandemic continues to affect us, we pray for those who are struggling, for those whose emotions are raw from fear or isolation, and for those exhausted by caring for others. May they all know the deep, abiding comfort of your presence in their hearts, Lord. As you have moved toward us in love, lead us to be present with them in their suffering. Gracious and generous God, give us joy that outlasts sorrow. Give us courage to bear us over any hurt or struggle. Give us hope that can carry us through despair. Give us a strong and loyal faith in you. You made us, you gave us life, and then you gave us that life again through Jesus, renewed and free from fear and death and sin. Thank you, loving God. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. As you go from here into the week ahead, with whatever joys and challenges it holds, do not get lost in discouragement or helplessness. Remember that you, just as you are, you are enough for Jesus. You are loved. Hold on to that truth, live in that hope, and may the peace of God, the blessing of Jesus, and the presence of the Holy Spirit be with you and among you all. Amen. Amen.